must have wealth. But you could have succeeded just as well without it. When I was old, perhaps I wanted my success while I was young. I couldn't wait. How could you sell yourself for money? I bought success at a great price. That is all. But what first made you think of doing such a thing? <laughs> Baron Arnheim. Ah, oh, damn scoundrel. No, no. A man of culture, charm, and distinction. One of the most intellectual men I have ever met. Yes, I prefer a gentlemanly fool any day. There's far more to be said for stupidity than people imagine. But how did he do it? One night after dinner at Lord Radley's, the Baron began talking about success in modern life. With that wonderfully fascinating, quiet voice of his, he expounded to us the most terrible of all philosophies, the philosophy of power. Luxury, he said, with only a background, and power, power over other men, power over the world, was the supreme pleasure, the one joy one never tired of, and only the rich possessed it. I think he saw the effect that he produced on me for... When I was going away, he said that if ever I could give him any private information of real value, he would make me a very rich man. I was dazed at the prospect he held out to me. Six weeks later, certain private documents passed through my hands. State documents? Yes. Oh, my dear Robert, I had no idea that you could be so weak. Weak? Do you really think it is weakness that yields to temptation? I tell you, there are terrible temptations that require a terrible strength to yield to. I had that strength. I sat down that same afternoon and wrote Baron Arnheim the letter that this woman now holds. He made three quarters of a million over the transaction. And you? I received from the Baron 110,000 pounds. You were worth more, Rob. Oh. In five years, I had trebled my fortune. Everything I touched turned to success. I remember reading somewhere that when the gods wish to punish us, they answer our prayers. Did you never suffer any regret for what you had done? No. But I have paid conscience money since then. I had the wild hope that I might disarm destiny. The sum that Baron Arnheim paid me, I have distributed in public charities... Twice over since then. <laughs> Public charities. Oh, my dear Robert, what a lot of harm you have done. Oh, Arthur, don't talk like that. <laughs> no, forget what I say. Of course, I will do everything I can to help. You know that. Thank you, Arthur. What is to be done? Well, the English are very fond of a man who admits that he's in the wrong. It's one of the best things in them. However, a confession in your case would not do. The money if you will allow me to say so, is awkward. You must begin by telling your wife the whole thing. I couldn't do it. And now this Mrs. Cheever. How can I defend myself against her? You knew her before, Arthur. Yes. Well, <laughs> so little that I got engaged to her. Oh, why was it broken off? Oh, I forget. At least it doesn't matter. She used to be confoundedly fond of money. Have you tried her with money? I offered her any sum of money she wanted. She refused. So the marvellous gospel of gold breaks down sometime. Robert, you must fight her. You must fight her. But how? I can't tell you at the moment. I haven't the slightest idea. But every person has some weak point. I shall send a telegram, a cipher telegram, to the embassy at Vienna to inquire if anything is known against her. It is always worthwhile asking a question. Although it is not always worthwhile answering one. She must have had some curious hold over Baron Arnheim. I wonder what it was. Yes, I wonder. Is Mr. Trafford in his room? Yes, Sir Robert. Tell him to have this sent off in cipher at once. Is that a moment to be lost? Yes, Sir Robert. Good afternoon, Lord Goring. Good afternoon, Lady Chilton. Have you been in the park? No, I've just come from the Women's Liberal Association. Where, by the way, Robert, your name is received with loud applause. And now I've come in to have my tea. You will wait and have some tea, won't you? For a little, thank you. I'll be back in a moment. I'm just going to take my hat off. Oh, no, please don't. 
It is so pretty. It is one of the prettiest hats that I have ever seen. I do hope the Women's Liberal Association greeted it with loud applause. We have much more important work to do than look at each other's bonnets, Lord Gordon. <laughs> You've been a good friend to me, Arthur. You've enabled me to tell you the truth. That is something. Ah, the truth is something I always get rid of as quickly as possible. This truth has always stifled me. I'll see you soon again, shall I? Certainly, whenever you like. You're not going, Robert. Yes, I, I have some letters to write, dear. Oh, you work too hard, Robert. You're looking so tired. It's nothing, dear, nothing. Do sit down. I'm so glad you've called. I want to talk to you about... Well, not about bonnets or the Woman's Liberal Association. You want to talk to me about uh, Mrs. Cheveley? Yes, you've guessed it. After you left last night, I found out that what she had said was really true. Of course, I made Robert write her a letter at once, withdrawing his promise. So he gave me to understand. To have kept it would have been the first stain on a career which has been stainless always. Robert must be above reproach. He's not like other men. He cannot afford to do what other men do. Don't you agree with me? You're Robert's greatest friend. No one except myself knows him better than you do. He has no secrets from me, and I don't think he has any from you. He certainly has no secrets from me. At least I don't think so. Uh, Lady Chilton, I have often thought that perhaps that you were just a little too unbending in your views on life. I think sometimes you, you don't make sufficient allowances. Now, supposing, for instance, that any public man, my father or Lord Merton or Robert, say, had years ago written some foolish letter to what someone... What sort of foolish letter? Oh, a letter gravely compromising one's position. I'm only taking an imaginary case. But Robert is as incapable of doing a foolish thing as he is of doing a wrong thing. <laughs> no one is incapable of doing a foolish thing. Lady Chilton, if ever you are in trouble... Trust me absolutely, and I will do everything that I can to help. If you want me, ask for my assistance, and you shall have it. Lord Goring, you're talking quite seriously. I don't think I've ever heard you talk like that before. Oh, you must excuse me, Lady Chilton. I promise you that I will never let it occur again. But I like you to be serious. Oh, Gertrude, don't say such dreadful things to Lord Goring. Seriousness will be very unbecoming to him. Good afternoon, Lord Goring. Pray, be as trivial as you can. Well, I'm afraid I'm a little out of practice this afternoon, Miss Mabel, and I was on the point of leaving. Just when I'd come in? What dreadful manners you have. I'm sure you were very badly brought up. I was. I wish I'd brought you up. I'm so sorry that you didn't. It's too late now, I suppose. I'm not so sure. Will you ride tomorrow morning? Yes, a day. Don't forget. Of course I do. Oh, by the way, Lady Chilton, there is no list of your guests in the morning post of today. It has apparently been crowded out by the County Council or the Lambeth Confidence or something equally boring. I wonder if I could have a list. I have a particular reason for asking. I'm sure Mr Trafford will be able to give you one. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Tommy Trafford is the most useful person in London. And who is the most ornamental? I am. How clever of you to <laughs> guess it. Goodbye, Lady Chilton, and you will remember what I said to you, won't you? Yes, but I don't know why you said it to me. <laughs> I hardly know myself. <laughs> Goodbye, Miss Mabel. Gertrude, I wish you would talk to Tommy Trafford. Well, what has poor Mr Trafford done this time? Robert says he's the best secretary he ever had. Well, Tommy's proposed to me again. Yes, really, Tommy does nothing but propose to me. He proposed to me this morning in broad daylight in front of that dreadful statue of Achilles. Really, the things that go on in front of that work of art are quite appalling. The police should interfere. You see, if he proposed at the top of his voice, I wouldn't mind so much. That might have some effect on the public. But he does it in this horrid confidential way, like a, like a doctor. Oh, I wish, Gertrude, you would talk to him. Tell him once a week is quite often enough to propose to anyone and that it should always be done in a manner that attracts some attention. Dear Mabel, don't talk like that. Besides, Robert thinks very highly of Mr Trafford. He believes he has a brilliant future before him. Oh, I wouldn't marry a man with a future before him for anything under the sun. <laughs> Mabel. Oh, I know you married a man with a future, didn't you? But then you see, my brother's a genius and you have a noble, self-sacrificing character. Oh, I've got to go round now to Major Basildon's. You remember we're giving a charity performance, don't you? I've got to act the triumph of something. I don't know what. Only hope it's the triumph of me. Only triumph I'm really interested in at the moment. 
Gertrude, do you know who's coming to see you? That dreadful Mrs. Cheveley in the most lovely gown. Did you ask her? Mrs. Cheveley coming to see me? Impossible. I assure you she's crossing the hall as large as life and not nearly so natural. You need not wait, Mabel. Remember that Lady Basildon is expecting you. Yes, I've got to stand on my head for charity, haven't I? <laughs> Lady Markby, Mrs. Cheveley. Oh, dear Gertrude, we just called to know if Mrs. Cheveley diamond brooch had been found. Here? I missed it when I got back to Claridge's. I thought perhaps I might have dropped it here. Well, I've heard nothing about it, but I'll ring for the butler. Oh, no, ask. no, pray don't trouble Lady Chilton. I just say I lost it at the opera before we came on here. The fact is, dear, we all scrabble and jostle us so much these days. I wonder if we have anything left on us at all by the end of the evening. <laughs> uh, what sort of brooch was it that you lost, Mrs. Cheveley? A diamond snake brooch with rubies, rather large rubies. Has a ruby and diamond brooch been found in any of the rooms this morning, Mason? No, my lady. Oh, it's uh, really of no consequence, Lady Chiltern. I'm so sorry to put you to any inconvenience. It has been of no inconvenience. Uh, that will do, Mason. You can bring tea. Oh. Well, I must say, it's most annoying to lose anything. I remember once at Bath, or oh, years ago, losing in the pump from a very handsome cameo bracelet my husband had given me. I don't think he's given me anything since, I'm sorry to say. May I give you some tea, Mrs. Chiefly? Thank you. Lady Markby. No, thank you, dear. I've promised to make another call. So if you'll allow me, I will leave Mrs. Cheveley in your charge and call back for her later. Well, certainly, mm -hmm. dear. I'll be glad to have a few minutes' conversation with Mrs. Cheveley. Oh, I thank you, Lady Chilton. I'm sure nothing would give me greater pleasure. No doubt you both have many happy memories of your school days to talk over together. Goodbye, dear. Shall I see you at Lady um, Bonner's tonight? I'm told she's discovered a wonderful new genius. He does um, uh, nothing at all, I believe, and that's a great comfort, is it not? Wonderful woman, Lady Markby. She talks more and says less than anyone I've ever met. She was made to be a public speaker. Mrs. Cheveley, I think it's right to tell you quite frankly that had I known who you really were, I should not have invited you to my house last night. Really? I could not have done so. I see, Gertrude, that after all these years, you've not changed a bit. I never change. Then life has taught you nothing. It has taught me that when a person has once been guilty of a dishonest and dishonorable action, they may be guilty of it a second time and should be shunned. Would you apply that rule to everyone? Yes, to everyone, without exception. Then I am very sorry for you, Gertrude. So you see now, I'm sure that for many reasons, any further acquaintance between us during your stay in London is quite impossible. <laughs> Do you know, Gertrude, I don't mind your talking morality to me a bit. Morality is merely an attitude we adopt towards people we personally dislike. You dislike me. I'm quite aware of that. And I've always detested you. And yet I've come here today to do you a service. <laughs> like the service you wished to render my husband last night, I suppose. Thank heavens I saved him from that. So it was you who made him write that insolent letter to me to break his promise? Yes. Well, then you must make him keep it. I will give you until tomorrow morning no more. If by then your husband doesn't solemnly bind himself to help me in this great scheme... This fraudulent speculation... Oh, call it what you choose. I hold your husband in the hollow of my hand. If you're wise, you'll make him do what I tell him. You are impertinent. What has my husband to do with a woman like you? In this world, like meets like. It's because your husband is himself fraudulent and dishonest that we pair so well together. Between you and him, there are chasms. But he and I are closer than friends. We're enemies linked together. The same sin binds us. How dare you class yourself with my husband? Leave my house. Your house? A house, everything in which was paid for by fraud. <laughs> Ask him what the origin of his fortune is. Get him to tell you how he sold to a stockbroker a cabinet secret. Learn from him to what you owe your position. 
It's not true. Robert, it's not true. Look at him. Can he deny it? Go. Go at once. <laughs> 